Hi, this is Dr. Claire, and today we're going to be talking about mechanisms of evolutionary change. So in our last uh, lecture, we were talking about Hardy-Weinberg equilibrium, and Hardy-Weinberg equilibrium is what you expect is going to happen when there's no evolution, when there's nothing interesting going on. Um, if Hardy-Weinberg equilibrium is not happening, if you're not in Hardy-Weinberg equilibrium, then something cool is going on, and that cool thing that's going on is evolution. And there's a number of different mechanisms through which evolution can occur, and a lot of these don't get a whole lot of attention. Um, so the known mechanisms through which evolution occur occurs are mutation, uh, which is random changes to the genetic code, gene flow, which is the movement of individuals between populations, genetic drift, which is random changes in allele frequency within a population, selection, which is when environmental pressure uh, causes change in the population, and non-random mating, which is when certain individuals prefer to mate with uh, other individuals based on certain characteristics. Okay, So we're going to go through uh, four of these mechanisms today. We're going to hit mutation, gene flow, genetic drift, and non-random mating. We'll save selection for another lecture because selection is probably the most important out of these five. Um, I've got non-random mating kind of separated off there because non-random mating, while it can disrupt Hardy-Weinberg equilibrium, does not always lead to evolution and we'll kind of explain why when we get to that one. Okay. All right, so let's start with mutation. So mutation is any change uh, in, uh, in the uh, genetic com composition of an individual. as where all genetic variation ultimately comes from. So DNA is a molecule. It's not fixed. It's not set in stone. Sometimes mistakes happen and uh, the sequence of the DNA can get slightly changed. And that is just a natural course of event. Mutations happen at a fairly constant rate. Um, there's certain things that can influence the rate of mutation, but it's something that kind of happens on a fairly regular basis. So, let's say you're an individual and you get a new mutation. You suddenly become Wolverine, right? No. Uh, most of the time, that's not actually what happens when you get a mutation. In fact, probably none of the time do you turn into Wolverine. However, um, there are some things that do happen when, when uh, a mutation arises. If that mutation, if that change is in a gene that does something, most of the time it's going to be harmful. Um, so most of the time uh, the proteins that our genes code for actually do a pretty good job of what they're doing and if you change something about that protein it actually makes it worse. So most mutations that do anything at all are harmful. So the example I have here is of a mutation in a fruit fly which turned their antennae into legs. As you can imagine, it's not very good to have legs growing out of your head. So this would be a harmful mutation. The other really common type of mutation are neutral mutations. So that's when the genetic code changes and it doesn't affect the individual at all. So for example, um, there's a lot of junk DNA in our genome that doesn't code for anything. Mutations that happen in the junk DNA don't do anything to the individual. Also, uh, the, the triplets of, of, uh, of uh, nucleotides that are codons that code for amino acids that go into the proteins, there's actually some duplication in there. So you can change one of the, amino, one of the um, nucleotides in the codon and it doesn't change the amino acid. So sometimes it is a, a mutation within a gene that actually does something, but it doesn't change the form of the protein, so there, again, there's no effect. So that would be a neutral mutation. And very, very rarely you can get mutations that are actually beneficial. So uh, one of the examples that um, people give a lot of the time is of a mutation that in moth populations that makes them darker and then that mutation could be beneficial if it uh, allows them to blend into polluted trees better than clean trees. Okay, so most of the time mutations either do nothing or they're bad. Very, very rarely mutations can be beneficial. <clears throat> so what kinds of things cause mutations? Um, one of the big causes of mutations is UV radiation, basically sunlight. Um, what sunlight does is it causes the, uh, the bases within the, um, within the strand of DNA to bind to another base that's next to them rather than across like they're supposed to. Um, and then when the enzymes that go through to replicate your DNA come through, they have trouble reading that section. And that can cause them to put in the wrong base pair there where, where uh, there should be. And so it switches from one base pair to another. So sunlight is really bad. That's why they always tell you to wear sunscreen when you're out in the sun um, because um, you might get skin cancer, right? As skin cancer arises from, from mutations that accumulate in your 
your body, particularly in parts of your body that are exposed to more um, things that cause mutations like the sun. Um, another really common uh, cause of mutation is actually x-rays. Um, modern doctors now have ways to minimize the amount of x-rays that people are exposed to when you want to like take pictures of your teeth, the dentist, or a broken bone. Um, but uh, in the past, they didn't really know that x-rays were bad. So you could like go to the shoe store and there was a little box and you would stand on the little box and put your feet under it and it would shine x-rays through the soles of your feet and then you could see the bones in your feet on the screen. Of course, you're also shining x-rays up through the soles of your feet and through the entire body. It's actually not a good thing. X-rays contain so much energy that they can actually break your DNA strands, and that's very, very bad. There are also a number of carcinogenic or mutagenic chemicals um, that actually, anything that binds to DNA is generally bad because, um, again, these enzymes that will replicate your DNA, if there's some crud stuck to the DNA, they can make mistakes, and so that increases the mutation rate. So you don't want crud stuck to your DNA. Um, <clears throat> one of the most potent mutagenic um, chemicals known to man is a, uh, is a uh, compound called aflatoxin, and it's actually found in very trace amounts in peanut butter. So my genetics professor, when I took genetics when I was an undergraduate, said that if, you, uh, if you're if you worried about mutation, mutations, pretty much the worst thing that you can do is eat a peanut butter and jelly sandwich in the sun, which is basically what I did my entire childhood. So there you go. I probably have a few mutations from that. All right. <clears throat> <clears throat> um, so what kinds of the, what are the rates of mutations? How often do they occur? Well, they're generally low on average uh, at any particular locus. So at any particular gene, um, there's an average of about one mutation per million zygotes. So a zygote is a fertilized egg. So basically one in a million individuals will have a particular mutation at that particular locus. Now, excuse me, you have about uh, 20,000 loci in your body, so one in a million chance of any particular locus having a mutation. Uh, that adds up to about 4% of the, of the population of zygotes are likely to have a mutation. Now, assuming all of those zygotes survive, some mutations are bad enough that uh, the zygote, the fertilized egg, actually won't develop. Um, and so that would be a, a case where you might have a miscarriage. But assuming those survive, that means that about 4% of people have at least one mutation in some, one gene somewhere in their body, okay? Um, so not terribly common, but maybe more common than you might think. Um, because mutations are rare, uh, they, they rarely upset Hardy-Weinberg equilibrium. When you have a large population, you don't really even notice the mutations within the allele frequencies in that population. So you don't tend to see that mutations generally upset Hardy-Weinberg very much. Okay, so that's mutations. Gene flow. Um, gene flow is basically movement of individuals from one population to another. Okay, um, so you can think of that as migration or um, uh, immigration, emigration, things like that. Um, so uh, the way I remember this, because people get gene flow and genetic drift confused, gene flow, if a river is flowing, it's moving from one location to another. Okay, so that's how you remember that it's individuals moving from one population to another. You're flowing from one place to another, okay? Um, so gene flow can bring new alleles into the population or it can change the frequency of alleles in a population by bringing those alleles with those individuals who move from one population to another. So let's take a look at, at an example. So here we have some lovely little Twitter birds. They are separated by a river. These two populations of Twitter birds uh, are relatively isolated from each other. Um, and the population on the north side of the river has a greater frequency of the blue allele. The population on the south side of the river has a greater frequency of the pink allele. Now we have some individuals who move from the south population to the north population. They happen to be all pink. So what is that gonna do to the frequency of the pink allele in the northern population? Well, you would expect that that would indeed increase the frequency of the pink allele in that population. So now you have more pink alleles in that population than you did before. Is that evolution? Okay, so let's think about how we define evolution. Evolution is the change in the allele frequency in a population over time, right? Have we changed the allele frequency in that northern population? Yes, we have. There are now no, more pink alleles than there were before. Therefore, evolution has occurred and uh, the population is now different than it was before. So that does count as evolution. All right, so we've got Twitter birds here. That's one example. Let's take a look at a real example. 
Um, these are water snakes that live on islands in Lake Erie. And if you're a snake on an island, um, the islands have little vegetation, no trees, and a lot of rocks. Um, so if you're a snake on an island, it's better to be a relatively plain snake, okay? If you're a snake on the mainland, on the other hand, there are trees, there are leaves, and so it actually is better to be a spotty snake. Okay, um, so you tend to see selective pressure. We're going to talk about selection in the next lecture. You tend to see selective pressure for plain snakes on islands and spotty snakes in the mainland. So if there were no gene flow at all, you would expect that all the snakes on the island would be plain and all the snakes on the mainland would be spotty because those are the, uh, the, the uh, phenotypes that are selected for in those environments. What you actually see is that on islands, most of the snakes are plain, but there are some spotty snakes. And on the mainland, most of the snakes are spotty, but there are some plain snakes. And that's because these water snakes, being water snakes, can swim. And they swim back and forth. And so there is gene flow between the islands and the mainlands that maintains that variation in the population. OK, that makes sense? OK, cool. All right, let's talk about genetic drift. Now remember I said people get gene flow and genetic drift confused. Flow, you're moving from one place to another. If you're drifting, you're just kind of floating around randomly, okay? You don't actually go in any particular direction. It's just a random process. And that's what genetic drift is. It's a random process that causes change in allele frequencies due to random chance, okay? Um, it doesn't have anything to do with fitness. It doesn't have anything to do with adaptation. It's just stupid dumb luck that can cause allele frequencies to change. And it's more important in small populations than in large populations. And the reason that is is because uh, stupid things in, that involve dumb luck have a greater effect on small populations. So let's take a look at this population of beetles here. It's a population of nine beetles, um, and there are 60% brown beetles and 30%, and well, 66% brown beetles and 33% uh, green beetles, right? So two-thirds are brown, one-third is green. Um, let's say a dude walk, comes by, and he's not watching where he's going. He's not trying to step on beetles, and he accidentally squishes two of the beetles. Uh, they both happen by chance to be green beetles because that just happens to be where he stepped and squished them. He wasn't trying to squish them. They weren't any uh, worse at getting away than the other beetles. They just had a bad day. They got unlucky and they got squished. All right. In a population of nine individuals, well, now you only have seven individuals and only one of the seven is green. Has that changed the allele frequency in the population? Yes, it has. Now the allele frequency is more biased towards that brown allele. But it was just dumb luck. It was just chance. Now, if you imagine that you had a thousand beetles and this dude walked by, and okay, and you still have the same frequencies. You have 66% brown and 33% uh, green. Dude walks by, steps on two green beetles. Um, well, now you have 666 brown beetles and 331 green beetles because he squished two green beetles. That really doesn't affect the allele frequencies very much. It has a very small effect. So dumb luck has a smaller effect on large populations than it does on small populations. Okay, So let's take a look at some examples of this. One of the, the consequences of genetic drift is what's called the population bottleneck. Um, if populations are, can, are um, brought down to a very small number, you tend to, by chance, lose a lot of the genetic diversity in the population. So if you take this sample bottle here of um, yellow, white, and blue beads, and um, that population gets reduced to a very small number, so you only shake out like five or six beads, and just by chance, none of the beads that you shake out are yellow, you've lost that yellow allele in the population. And it's not because the yellow allele is worse, it was just dumb luck, it didn't shake out of the bottle. Um, and so that would be an example of a population bottleneck where you have drift, that dumb luck, that reduced the genetic variation. So you lost one of those alleles. All right, let's take a look at that in the real world. This is the greater prairie chicken. The greater prairie chicken is a, um, a bird that lives on the prairie. And they have this elaborate mating display, and they're actually kind of cool. But because the prairie, a lot of the prairie has been turned into agricultural land, they lost a lot of their habitat, and their populations got very, very low. This particular population is in Illinois. And um, 
Their populations declined because of habitat loss, but then they created this lovely uh, uh, reserve for them where they protected the prairie and they had this great place for them to live. And they were looking at these prairie chickens and they were like, here, here's this great place for you to live. And they still didn't recover. They still didn't come back to their, they didn't start to, to, to the population didn't grow to fill that lovely new prairie that they created for the chickens. Um, and so they were trying to figure out why and it turned out that what happened was the population got so low and it lost so much genetic variation that it was extremely inbred. And so the, the chickens actually be, were infertile and they were all mating with, and we only have like 10 individuals in the population and they're all your brothers. You're mating with someone who's related to, to you and you tend to see this, this accumulation of deleterious recessive alleles. It's one of the traits that you tend to see with population bottlenecks. And so the chickens were, were so inbred and had so little genetic variability that even though they had habitat, they weren't able to recover um, because of the, that loss in the genetic variation. Um, another example is the founder's effect. Founder's effect is when you have a new population that's founded by only a few individuals. So a few individuals go to a new place, and of course because there's only a few individuals, when they start there, they only have a few different alleles at whatever gene. And so you tend to see um, things that are, that are often rare in the greater population be uh, very common among founders. So here, an example here, this is a, a population of um, pitcher plants in a bog in Wisconsin, and in this particular bog, they, they think that these pitcher plants were, this population of pitcher plants was founded by a single individual um, who had a purple allele. Normally these plants are green, but in this population, this individual who founded the population just happened to have a purple allele, and so all the pitcher plants in that population are purple. Um, and you can see other things like that. In the case of humans, there are um, some uh, groups of humans who, um, tend to mate within their same group. So uh, a lot of times those are cultural groups or religious groups. And you can see uh, an increase in the frequency of certain alleles within the, those groups as well. So sometimes you see things like that as well. All right, non-random mating. This is our last um, evolutionary mechanism. Non-random mating uh, is when um, individuals choose mates based on uh, their own phenotype. So they choose mates that are either similar to themselves or they choose mates that are different from themselves. Um, it doesn't influence the number of mates that they get. That's sexual selection, and we'll talk about that later. So if you, it, sexual selection is when one particular phenotype gets more mates than another phenotype. This is not that. Non-random mating is that this particular phenotype prefers to mate with this other phenotype, but um, it doesn't increase their reproductive success in any way, okay? So, um, Individuals either choose in, uh, individuals to mate with that look like themselves in the case of these redheaded nerds here. So in this, in this uh, Gary Larson cartoon, redheaded nerds prefer other redheaded nerds. Um, or they choose individuals who look different from themselves. Okay? Um, <clears throat> so when you choose individuals where you look the same, that's, uh, that is what's called assortative mating. And that tends to increase the frequency of homozygotes in the population. So you get more homozygotes than you would expect based on Hardy-Weinberg. If you choose someone who looks different from you, they tend to have different alleles than you do. So you, that tends to increase the number of heterozygotes in the population more than you would expect by Hardy-Weinberg. So it changes the, the uh, observed genotype frequency, but it doesn't change the allele frequency. And that's why this is different from the other mechanisms that we were talking about. So it changes the genotype frequency, but not the allele frequency, okay? Um, so let's take a look at some of these in real life. Uh, one of the most extreme types of non-random mating is what's called selfing. A lot of plants do this, where they basically mate with yourself. You can't mate with anyone who is more like you than yourself, right? And so if you're a plant and you produce both sperm and eggs, which most plants do, and you fertilize your eggs with your own sperm, that is a very extreme case of assortative mating. You are mating with someone who is identical to you. You. Okay, so, um, and um, when you self, 
you ha I mean, you have all of your same alleles, so you tend to see a great increase in the amount of homozygosity within those individuals and a great decrease in the number of heterozygotes, okay? Um, one great example is the dandelion. Um, dandelions almost always self, and so if you, any dandelion in your yard, they have self so many times that they're basically clones of themselves, and there's very, very little genetic variation among dandelions. They're just really, really good at being dandelions, okay? All right. Um, so that's an example of uh, assortative mating. There's also disassortative mating. In disassortative mating, it tends to reduce the number of homozygotes and increase the number of heterozygotes. Um, this little bird here is a white-throated sparrow. Uh, white-throated sparrows have two morphs. This is not a male and a female. Both males and females can be either black or they can be tan. And tan males only mate with black females and, and black males only mate with tan females. So they always mate with the one that looks different from them. Um, and that has to do with um, largely uh, some behavioral differences between them. Um, the, the tan individuals, both males and females, tend to be, be better parents, um, whereas the black individuals tend to be more aggressive and um, better at defending territories. So by pairing them together, you end up with a good coupling where they are successful. Okay. All right. Those are our mechanisms of evolution. Uh, hope you enjoyed the lecture. Um, check out the selection lecture coming up next.